Welcome everyone and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Today we will be talking about deep sea mining as part of our webinar series, which aims to shed some light on the topic of critical materials for the energy transition. My name is Martina Lyons and I work at IRENA uh, on this topic together with my IRENA colleagues and I will moderate uh, today's webinar. For those of you who are not familiar with IRENA, we are an intergovernmental organization. We have currently 168 member countries and another 16 countries are in their accession process. And we support countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future. And driving their transition in line with 1.5 degree pathway will substantially raise demand for certain minerals and metals that are used in batteries, electric vehicles, wind turbine and solar panels. So the topic of critical materials have therefore has therefore emerged as an important discussion point in the energy community. And a better understanding of the mind and technology has become a priority. Lately, we saw a lot of, or we see a lot of traction around the topic of deep sea mining, which has been driven a lot by the projected demands for metals and the desire also for economic development. But deep sea mining remains controversial. Uh, with some political leaders calling for moratorium on deep sea mining, pending further research into its impact. There are significant data gaps in understanding the ECG risks. Such uncertainties are compounding by the fact that there are no commercial projects to capture the precedent, either in terms of project design or the impact of design on envir environment and people. <clears throat> so today we will share some insight and try to answer some of the questions, such as what is deep sea mining? Is it happening already? What technologies are being used? Who decide who mines in the international water? And under what rules? Is it sustainable? Can we make it sustainable? Is something being done to make it sustainable? So before we move to onto presentation and discussion to share information about that, we want to also run a short poll just to mark how familiar you are with the topic and what angle of the topic um, are you interested in. And afterwards, we will uh, hear a set of three presentation, one which will set the scene and then two presentation more focus on the technology. And next, we will have a discussion with our presenters and additional speakers to discuss the topic, existing experience so far, and what lies ahead uh, for deep sea mining. Feel free to do, drop questions uh, on the topic uh, in the Q&A part or share your experience and knowledge uh, with us in the chat box. We will be monitoring your question and we will try to select some to be answered by our guest speakers. And before we start, I would like to mention that the webinar is being recorded and uh, recording uh, the recording together with the presentation slides will be posted on IRENA website within the next uh, 48 hours. So let's start with the polling questions. May I ask if we can uh, put the first polling questions uh, on the screen? So we, we are asking you how familiar you are with the deep sea mining. And uh, you can choose whether you are very familiar or familiar, somehow, somewhat familiar or not familiar at all. And uh, yeah, we will give you around 30, 40 seconds to do that. And then we will just look on the answer uh, because uh, it will inform us a little bit about the direction of the panel discussion also. So let's give it another second. And maybe we can show the, the results now. So there is there is quite a big amount of people who are really not that not familiar at all or somehow familiar. So we really hope that this will, this will shed some light uh, on the topic too. And then we have another question. And we are here, we are asking about your areas of interest in a topic. Uh, so are you more interested in just the fundamentals of the technology or more about breakthroughs, improvements, or more about what is being done from the technology perspective to minimize the environmental impact? <clears throat> so let's give it another 10 seconds. Okay, and let's let's look on the, on the result. Okay, that, so we really hope that this webinar will uh, yeah, yeah, that uh, yeah, we are very happy that you join and you will you will get some insights on that. So, um, and now let's let's move to the to the agenda. Uh, so without any further 
further ado, let's let's move to the presentation. So let me uh, welcome Dolph Gillen, who is the uh, director of the Innovation and Technology Center and who leads the work on uh, critical materials that will set the scene for the follow-up discussion. So Dolph, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Martina, and hello, everyone. I'll uh, be uh, brief if we move to the next uh, slide. So um, at ARENA, we picked up the topic of critical materials about a year ago. We've done some uh, initial uh, analysis, scoping the topic, deep dives for lithium and for uh, rare earth uh, elements. Uh, and all with the idea to, to inform our uh, 168 member countries on uh, what, is this now an, an important issue that uh, uh, may affect the direction and the speed of energy transition and what can be done about it. Next one, please. So, uh, it's a fact that and, uh, the demand for a number of these, uh, what's called critical materials is rapidly increasing. Uh, a number of key ones are listed here. So it's materials to produce permanent magnets. So that's rare earth elements. It's materials for batteries such as lithium, but also nickel. And that is very relevant in the context of today's uh, discussion. And also, maybe less known is that, for example, uh, about 15% of all silver that is produced every year is going into solar, uh, solar PV manufacturing. If you look at the table, you see that the, the order of magnitude vary widely. So for, for copper, it's tens of millions of tons per year. For nickel, it's millions of tons per year. For lithium, it's kilotons per year, and for neodymium, well, hundreds of kilotons per year, and for neodymium, tens of kilotons per year. So you have to keep these different orders of magnitude in mind as we, we talk uh, about these, these materials. And so you see that for these battery materials, nickel, et cetera, we're talking millions of tons per year. Next one, please. Now, um, if you take the example of nickel, so what, what is uh, key there is that there is, a, there is a growth projected, may double or triple. There is a lot of, uh, of proven nickel reserves, 19 million tons. Uh, there is a significant on-land resource, but the subsea deposits double that roughly. So that gives you a little bit of context and uh, today's nickel mining is ramping up very rapidly in Indonesia and in uh, the Philippines. So uh, there are also deposits in other parts of the world, in Australia and Eastern Africa. Uh, but the, the, um, that is, is at the moment it's growing there. It has environmental impacts. Uh, and uh, so you, you get to a situation where you have kind of a trade-off, which, which in environmental impacts are more significant. Is it in the rainforest or is it a uh, subsea? Difficult discussion and very charged discussion at the moment. And you see also in the answer to the, to the, to the, the questionnaire that this, this environmental impacts at the top of the agenda. Um, the next one, please. There is more. Okay, that's it. So uh, what we hope to do through this webinar is to give you a little bit more insight on this uh, uh, important discussion around subsea mining. So uh, what is the status and what is, is going to happen? It's at the moment receiving a lot of attention and a number of important decisions are to be made. And hopefully at the end of this hour, you know a bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dolph. This said the scenes uh, very nicely. And next, I would like to invite Mr. John Machin. Uh, John is a, a head of offshore development with a metals company. He will uh, provide us with some insight into the technology for deep sea mining. Um, John, over to you. Yes. Uh, 
but thank you very much, Martina and uh, Dolph. Um, if I can just get straight into it, the, the, the briefing for everybody then. Um, so this is a, a short briefing um, on solving the metal shortages with a high grade, lower impact and abundant source from the seafloor. And I, I'm John Machin, Head of Offshore uh, Development at the Metals Company. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, move on uh, to the next slide, please. Um, so the briefing will be about um, uh, our development of a new type of high grade and abundant resource that requires uh, no social displacement, no hard rock mining, and no fixed infrastructure. Next slide, please. And this abundant resource um, uh, is called uh, polymetallic nodules. And here's uh, what it looks like. It's on the seabed. Here's a video of uh, the actual uh, resource uh, in, in a water depth, uh, very deep water depth of uh, 4,300 meters in this case. And as you can see, um, these are uh, a multitude uh, of, um, of rock nodules. They're about the size of small potatoes, if you like. Um, rather uniform, rather consistent, and they lie on the seabed. They actually lie on or within the top, uh, literally few centimeters of the seabed, uh, giving a resource which is essentially a two-dimensional uh, layer on the seabed. Next slide, please. And um, we've spent the last, as a company, we've spent the last 10 years exploring um, and uh, surveying and mapping this resource with a combination of surface vessels and uh, underwater autonomous drones. And in doing so, we've developed a lot of technology surrounding um, uh, software algorithms, artificial intelligence algorithms, uh, in order to map and locate these, these uh, polymetallic nodules uh, as efficiently um, as, as, as possible. Next slide, please. Um, one of the reasons the company has embarked on this development program, and we've been working on this for over 15 years now, is that um, this is not a new uh, source of uh, uh, minerals known to mankind. In fact, in the 1970s, a lot of feasibility uh, testing work was done on this resource in the Pacific Ocean, uh, in, the, in the area called the Clary, Clary and Clipperton zone of the Pacific Ocean, which is where we've decided to, to, to work uh, with our sponsoring partners. And in the 1970s, a great deal of effort was put into proving the technical feasibility of recovering these, these minerals from the polymetallic nodules. Next slide, please. And um, in terms of geographic location, uh, the clarion Clipperton zone of the central southern Pacific is shown here on this, uh, this, this, this slide, uh, shown on the, the left on the map. And you can see it's... Uh, approximately it's, it's offshore uh, in the ocean offshore uh, Mexico um, it's about uh, 1500 nautical miles west of Mexico and in between Mexico and Hawaii um, if, if you like and um, the metals company is involved and we have control of three uh, exclusive license areas um, with three uh, sponsoring partners um, the Nori license area sponsored by the Republic of Nauru, the Tomal license area sponsored by the Kingdom of Tonga, and the Marawa uh, area sponsored by the Republic of Kiribati. And for two of these areas, we've, we've published economic statements. For Nori and for Tomal, we've published economic statements, and some of the data here shown on the right, but it reveals a, a very significant quantity of uh, critical minerals, uh, critical battery minerals, in fact. and um, as a, as, a, as a number, we, 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 we're quoting that enough uh, battery minerals, minerals are, are, are stated to electrify the entire US vehicle fleet, uh, for, for example. Next slide, please. In fact, the, the quantum of um, the, uh, the uh, resource uh, is, uh, is, is, as I say, um, very significant. Um, according to uh, mining.com, uh, website, um, our two uh, stated uh, resources, Nori and Tommel, constitute uh, the two largest undeveloped nickel uh, projects on the planet, for example. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, and this is in context of the introduction from um, Martina and Dolph, where it's pointed out that these critical minerals, the growth in supply required is uh, likely to come uh, from uh, Asia, Indonesia, Philippines were mentioned. Um, and uh, we're in this uh, place now where uh, as a global community, we have to look at uh, the uh, growth from terrestrial mining versus uh, offshore mining. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I mean, the uh, as has been stated in the introduction, it's um, it's a difficult debate uh, because terrestrial mining uh, definitely has environmental impacts um, in the rainforests and so forth in Asia. Um, and uh, I'll talk some more in this the remainder of this briefing about some of the impacts that offshore mining creates, but also how we intend to to mitigate and resolve them. Next slide, please. And um, yeah, as part of that, uh, we are um, we are heavily invested in currently massively invested in scientific and environmental research, and we're we're saying we're currently funding the largest marine seafloor to surface research program in history, and our target is very much uh, lowering ESG goals right right from the outset of our our, our project. In fact, next slide, please. And to that extent, we've um, spending a very significant amount of money on a on science, partnering with the world's leading marine science and marine environmental organisations. And we've um, performed, uh, are performing, and have now performed well over a hundred different studies um, with several vessel years spent at sea and a number of offshore, uh, major offshore programs, research programs conducted. Next slide, please. And furthermore, we're about to embark on a, uh, a integrated pilot mining test where we're actually in, uh, taking to the site and we'll be testing um, the components and testing the environmental impacts of uh, a full uh, integrated uh, seafloor to surface mining system which is shown here as a photograph of the, the vessel our partner All Seas um, has converted for the project. And you can also see the, uh, the, the seaboard bed robot that is designed to pick up these uh, small potato sized nodules. Next slide, please. And um, on the seabed, the robot picking up the nodules looks a little bit like this. Um, this is actually uh, another uh, contractor. Uh, called GSR, but they've published the, this is actually an animation, but I don't think it's running, but uh, it's just worth seeing if you visit, oh, here it is. Uh, and you can see the method we, we use um, to pick up the nodules is similar to what GSR is showing here, which is a, uh, a, a low impact um, uh, hydraulic uh, system for lifting the nodules off the seabed designed to create the minimum impact on the seabed and create the minimum turbulence and turbidity while maximizing nodule recovery. Next slide, please. And uh, the overall system looks a bit like this. The sketch on the right depicts um, uh, how the overall uh, integrated pilot mining system will work. You can see the uh, the uh, on the seabed, um, the depiction of the, the, the tracked robot is connected to the vessel through a series of pipes. One pipe is a flexible pipe called a jumper hose. And then there's a vertical steel pipe which connects uh, all the way up to the vessel. That's got a diameter of about 10 to 20 inches, but varying all the way up through the water column, which as I stated is over 4,000 meters uh, water depth. Um, at the, the vessel, we do uh, separate these polymetallic nodules from any entrained seabed sediment, which is uh, we're gathered up at the same time. We're trying to minimize that. We're working to minimize that seabed sediment, but that sediment is separated and that sediment is uh, returned into the ocean at a carefully selected water depth in the mid-water column, which is designed to create the most uh, uh, benign possible um, turbidity plume and uh, uh, turbidity uh, cloud uh, in, in, in the water column. And um, quite a lot of information to discuss about that, which is considered to be one of our more significant environmental impacts of which we've 
done and are doing a huge amount of work to, to, to minimize. Next slide, please. So this has culminated in our submission of an environmental um, impact statement, both for the pilot mining system and um, we will be uh, working on uh, future environmental impact systems based on the results of the pilot mining systems for, for our future uh, production we, we, uh, we, we intend to, to put in place. And um, the uh, environmental impact statement, obviously, uh, which is published, by the way, on the internet, um, goes into, uh, I think, a great deal of detail on many of these impacts and what we're doing to minimize them and resolve them. And on that, um, some closing the presentation now, some talk about uh, some of the technology we're deploying to do just that. And um, the next slide is a very short uh, talk from our head of ocean science, Dr. Gregory Stone, on this subject. This is a video. We're at the dawn of a new age. People need to see what's happening with large industrial activities on the planet that concern everybody's welfare. And it's important that it be transparent, that people can see and understand what's going on. And we as a company, the metals company, are developing the hardware and the software to monitor our activities where we collect polymetallic nodules to supply metals for the world. People will be able to go to their computer and see what's happening. The way to think about it is like guardrails on a highway. We'll have a certain area of operation that we know is where we want to be, that we feel is acceptable. And if for some reason something unforeseen happens, we'll know right away and we can hit the stop button and make a new plant. And this is something that's very new and we're very proud to be developing this uh, and be leaders in this area. I'm devoting all of my time to it. You're at the dawn of a new... Yes, that's uh, Dr. Gregory Stone, our chief ocean scientist, with a few words on some of the investment in technology and artificial intelligence systems we, we've been developing and we'll be testing this year together with our fully integrated uh, pilot pilot system. And finally, uh, the last slide is just a few words about what we believe is some of the value we're creating um, with our sponsors, the Republic of Nauru and uh, the Kingdom of Tonga in particular. And, um, you know, part of our remit um, under our regulator, the International Seabed Authority, is to develop these resources in conjunction with developing nations, our sponsoring states here are Nauru and, and Tonga, and um, a great deal of um, work and investment um, and is ploughed back into uh, the, the, the states and we work very closely with them. Um, on a number of levels, including the development of technology and um, ocean ocean mining um, systems, and um, we have a very strong and uh, fruitful relationship with them. I think I, I would definitely state, and that really concludes my my uh, briefing. Sorry, a lot of information to cram in, but um, hopefully that gives you um, an, an overview. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for yeah, a really insightful information, full of a lot of yeah. A lot of insights, a lot of information. But next, let's move uh, quickly to the next presentation and the last one before we head to the panel discussion. So I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Uli Schwarz Schampera. He's a program management officer in mining uh, geology at the International Seabed Authority. Uli, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice early morning from Kingston. <laughs> It's a dark outside, but, but what I want to do is, or I'm, I'm trying to bring some light into uh, the seabed, international, international seabed and the International Seabed Authority. The International, international Seabed Authority has the mandate uh, to regulate everything which is going on on the seabed outside national jurisdiction. Uh, you may be aware of, of the fact that, that outside the 200 kilometer or oh, 200 nautical mile uh, uh, border of continents, uh, the international seabed begins. And this is a benefit uh, uh, that's, uh, this belongs to humankind. And this needs to be regulated. So uh, any activities on the international seabed are regulated by the International Seabed Authority, which, which includes contracts and so on. And uh, I'm gonna show you uh, the next slides, what it's all about. Thank you, next one. Yes, right. So what, what are we talking about? Uh, what are the resources 
or potential resources. Uh, we've heard a little bit about polymanganese manganese nodules just in the talk before. Uh, uh, polymetallic manganese nodules are, as we heard, resources for copper, cobalt, nickel, manganese, uh, this is just distinct amount of lithium, distinct amount of other important and considered critical metals as well. Uh, they basically cover abyssal plains in all oceans, but the conditions in some of the basins are just more or are just better actually to define these as potential resources and eventually also as PMN uh, uh, deposits. Uh, the second class are polymetallic massive sulfide. Polymetallic, polymetallic massive sulfides originate at ridges, so at, at spreading centers in the more or less center of the oceans. Uh, they are uh, defined on the seabed uh, in many cases as plume creating hydrothermal vent, as you can see on the picture down there. Um, we do know these equivalents on land because we mine them since, since decades uh, as volcanic coastal and massive sulfide deposits. And uh, they have a share of about 20% of worldwide copper production, 25% uh, of zinc production and a reasonable amount of lead, but also very important trace methods like selenium, gallium, antimony, and so on. And the third class uh, are uh, defined as cobalt-rich ferromanganese crusts. They form on, on submarine seamounts, inactive ones, uh, former volcanoes. Now uh, they, they, they are forming crusts over time. Uh, cobalt-rich ferrom ferromanganese crusts grow from the water, grow from the precipitation uh, or enrichment from the seawater and they are particularly rich in cobalt and tellurium uh, and also a little bit in, in platinum and these are th the three classes where uh, uh, exploration licenses exist with the international civil authority so any any party any company any uh, governmental organization who are interested in doing ex exploration at the moment, exploration on these uh, three mineral classes have to apply uh, for an exploration license with the International Seabed Authority. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, and here you can see uh, what I just was explaining. We have a series of known hydrothermal vent fields or full metallic mass of sulfides along the mid-ocean ridges, as you can see here. Some of them are active, some are inactive, some, some are inferred, which means not well-defined on the seabed, but they occur along the mid-ocean ridges. Uh, the light gray areas, actually, they are defining areas where you can find polymetallic manganese nodules, also not rare, as you can see. Uh, but there are better ones and there are worse ones. I mean, this, this is just similar as uh, potential or existing oil deposits on land. And in this little brownish color, uh, there are areas for cobalt-rich ferro ferromanganese crusts. Um, they, as I said, occur on submarine volcanoes or old submarine volcanoes, seamount, plateaus, and they also cover larger areas in the international oceans. Next slide, please. Yes, so uh, up to now, the International Civil Authority has 31 contractors or contracts basically out of 22 contractors, different contractors and all the activities can only occur if, if, if the contractors apply for an exploration license and then eventually for an exploitation license, which is not existing yet, which is under, under uh, development just now. So there's no active seabed mining going on, but there, is, there are the first contractors who start uh, 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 doing, doing test mining, testing equipment for potential seabed mining in the future. So what we have, uh, there are 
17 contractors being busy in the so-called clearing Clipperton zone, which is in between two major tectonic fracture zones, Clarion and Clipperton. Uh, on this picture, you can see uh, these, these patches in the central Pacific. Along the northern mid-Atlantic ridge, there are three contractors uh, for polymetallic mass of sulfides. Uh, in the southern Atlantic, uh, there's one contractor for uh, cobalt rich these crusts. The Indian Ocean has uh, four, con four contractors for polymetallic mass of sulfides, plus one contractor for polymetallic manganese nodules. And then in the uh, Western Pacific, we do have uh, one contractor for uh, polymetallic, polymetallic manganese nodules and four more contractors for, for cobalt rich ferro manganese crusts. Next slide, please. Yes. What are the technologies? I mean, how, how do we know that there are uh, resources? What do we do? So there are basically methods, technologies, which are used since, since decades now for marine research. Marine research is well established in many countries. Uh, what they need are dedicated ships, which are capable of producing seabed maps. Uh, they, they also carry a remotely operated vehicles, sometimes even submarines, research submarines, small ones, which can go to, to great depth. Uh, there are TV sleds, uh, uh, there are CTDs, uh, CTD tools, which measure temperatures, salinity, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the density and, and depth of, uh, of the water column. Uh, there are other tools to study the water column and all these tools are necessary in order to do a proper exploration and then report the results in annual reports to the International Seabed Authority. So this is highly regulated. And uh, this, is, this also uh, uh, requires a distinct, um, uh, or requires distinct activities by the contractor and report this to the International Seabed Authority. Everything which is related to environmental studies and environmental studies always take 50% of the entire effort of doing exploration. It's not just metals, it's also environment. These 50% is, is, has also to be reported, it's tested by experts at the ISA as well as the legal and technical uh, commission and is then also going public. So ISA has a deep data database. That's how it's called. And this is, this is free to use for the public to use the environmental data produced by the, uh, by the contractors. And that's one of the only, only cases when you really can follow exploration activities, environmental studies, and use the data which is produced. It's pretty unique, very important, of course. Next slide, please. Yeah, what are technologies for potential exploitation? Uh, we've seen the concept uh, for the collection of polymetallic manganese nodules. Uh, uh, there was one major test by GSR. It's one contractor based in Belgium. Uh, it happened la last year in two uh, contract areas by, by GSR and BGR. Uh, we've seen the, uh, the little movie before. Um, uh, this. This was quite successful, but still it was not designed as a complete mining test. It's still a test of the tool for collecting the nodules. Um, other contractors actually, they go for complete mining tests, mining equipment, as we just heard before. Um, uh, these tools actually, as, as we also heard, are not new. They, they have been tested in a way, but with different technologies. Of course, uh, since the 1970s, we have major progress in technologies. We have major progress in controlling what, what is actually happening on the seabed. And, and uh, the environmental monitoring, which is, which is taking place, has also 
quite developed uh, with a number of different sensor systems and and control systems and we've just seen one solution uh, called dashboard by 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 nori or the metals company other technologies for mining sulfides are crawler type systems uh, uh, which have been tested the first complete test for for producing marine metals have been done by by japan by the ministry for economic affairs they tested in their own territory in the okinawa trough with the japanese they tested the mining of polymetallic uh, metal sulfides and this was a multi-ship operation and quite successful according to uh, to the reporting by the ministry mining the seabed as we heard before is is done since quite some time uh, offshore namibia in south africa by by dep marine uh, or dep uh, de bears basically on namdep they collect diamonds from shallow waters also in the territory of namibia or south africa but they use vertical right uh, vertical uh, trench cutter technology and it's believed by some companies that these vertical systems are much more uh, much better to use actually as soon as you have to go to greater depth uh, which would be the case for polymetallic massive sulfides not uh, not at all for nodules because nodules are just lying on the seabed uh, for the crusts uh, you need to recover a distinct uh, thickness from the sea mount and this also requires some some grinding technologies and of course if you grind something you want to get it on your ship if mining has been done and not lose it on the way up so this also has has to has to be kept in mind that it needs a reasonable uh well well working system to get the mine material uh up to the production platform okay next slide please yeah, uh, exploration, but especially exploitation requires monitoring. The International Seabed Authority is, is or has to control who's doing what, how and, and uh, where, at what time. And for this, ISA is establishing a monitoring system. We have the first studies on how to do it. And this picture just shows what what kind of technologies would be needed. Uh, uh, those are autonomous uh, uh, vehicles. Uh, 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 there are satellite systems. We need to get data which is recovered from the seabed during the activities uh, on, on shore, right? So which needs uh, acoustic devices to bring it on to the surface of the oceans and then further on the satellites. Uh, Back to land so there is a variety of of or, uh, apologies we just need to a little bit speed up because we have just yeah yeah, yeah. i'm yeah. sorry i'm almost done there is a variety of technologies uh, which are developed and which will be used in a in a uh, in, a, in an approach we we have to control by i say next slide please Yes, and then last but not least, a uh, uh, distinct mandate of ISA is marine scientific research. And for this, we also contribute bathymetric data from the contractors to the international world, which means we have a cooperation with the International Hydrographic uh, Organization called Area 2030. This is also to support the UN decade uh, of uh, the UN Ocean Decade 2030. Uh, as I said, uh, there's deep data, uh, which is also used in order to perform capacity building for experts from developing countries. And right now we do have five different experts from Cameroon, Tanzania, Ghana, Kenya, uh, who are working on distinct research topics in order to, to use the data, environmental data, produced by the contractors and 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 write up the stuff to to inform the public about activities and research and knowledge gaps uh, from the seabed thank you next slide 
it's and awesome. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let's move quickly. Um, so coming back to the agenda, we are now uh, halfway uh, through. After hearing some presentation about the state of play and uh, and uh, yeah, what lies ahead, uh, let's, let's continue discussing. We are not trying to make any conclusion whether this is a right pathway or a wrong pathway. We are really just trying to raise awareness of what is going on. So I would like to now welcome back John and Ulrich and um, and also uh, uh, your excellency, Ms. Margot Dea from Nauru uh, to join the discussion. Again, thank you all for joining. I know that uh, your excellency and also Ulrich are, are joining from really cruel timing around 2, 3 a.m. So special thank you. Um, and uh, let's, go, uh, let's go to the questions. Um, so I would like to start with you, Ulrich. Uh, can you tell us when did the interest in deep sea mining begin? We heard it a little bit uh, in the presentation from John, but if you can very quickly just say like what has been the trajectory since the very first interest and, and today? Yeah, yeah. As, uh, as we heard before, uh, it started very early in the 70s. And, and actually among the uh, most interesting part of studying polymetallic manganese nodules was the reason why it was started, which was, uh, which was the, the, uh, the search for a sunken Russian submarine. There's an amazing documentary out there. And this, sir, uh, this search for a sunken Russian submarine by, by, by US Navy was actually uh, 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 triggered or which was described as the first exploration activity for polymetallic manganese nodules. <laughs> uh, quite, quite, quite funny story, but up from then it, it started to become, to raise a major interest by many countries. And we've seen uh, the different countries involved. And this happened all the way through the 17th to beginning 80s. And that's when people recognize that there are more uh, resources on land available for, for cheaper prices as it was predicted. And that's when the activities stopped in a way, but uh, actually marine scientific research benefited a lot from the first activities. And uh, yeah, and it never stopped, right? So researchers yeah. were continuing these activities up to now. Thanks. Thank you. And I will stay one, uh, for one more question with you. If you can elaborate a little bit more about the role of ICA in deep sea mining and particularly what is occupying you currently the most at the agency when it comes to deep sea mining about the regulation, if you can yeah. share some about those. Yeah. So the idea of the ISA is regulating uh, the area which is not belonging to anyone or belonging to humankind in, in total, right? Uh, ISA has, has 167 country members plus EU. So it represents basically uh, the, the entire world, uh, the countries which ratified uh, the contracts and is regulating the activities. And that's the first time actually that activities for mining uh, uh, are regulated before mining actually starts. And that's a major benefit of, of ISA, right? And, and this needs, and this gets a lot of support by the member countries and saying, yes, we want to agree on how marine mining will be done in the future. And for this, we need sound, reasonable regulations on how to do it. This has never been done on land, for example, right? So it's a major example of, of how well things can be done if countries work together and set up a sound set of regulations. Thank you very much. And uh, that was very insightful and I think very relevant for, for the discussion. And now uh, let me move to your excellency, Ms. Margot Deye. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion about Nauru and the reasons why you utilize this Article 15, the two year trigger and just for the audience, to know this is a clause of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, own clause that allows member states to notify the ICAs of their intention to start deep sea mining. So why did you do that? And how do you feel that this will assist uh, the industry? Thank you. Ah, you are muted. I'm sorry, it's like 4 a.m. now <laughs> in New York. 
Let me first of all thank you and let me thank the presenters. Uh, excellent presentation uh, on what's happening with the seabed mining or what the intention is. So let me first of all highlight that as a small island developing state, a Pacific small island developing state, the whole reason, if you look beyond the context of just deep sea mining, the context of climate change, and I know Irina placed a lot with um, renewable energy, and you support us in that, uh, that agenda. We've submitted enhanced NDCs to achieve what we what we call for 50% renewable by 2050. And also we further commit to 100% renewable by, by 2030 and then by 2050. That's our new enhanced NDCs that we've submitted to the UNFCCC to reduce emissions, although we're not the biggest emitters in the world. That's and understate that's I just wanted to underline that so that you understand the reason for countries like mine who are in the existential threat for the impacts of climate change, the adverse impacts of climate change, we're at that brink of that. And the science is clear, we're not, we're not, IPCC is clear, we're not getting to whatever we need to survive as a country, as a viability. So the 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 opportunity to move towards deep sea mining, the opportunity to transition towards renewable and clean energy is a must. And this is based on the targets established by the Paris Agree Climate Agreement in 2015. This is, also, this is only achievable by decarbonizing the energy sector and transitioning to a global economy powered by clean transition. Renewable energy, I'm sorry, this is 4 a.m. and I mincing my words so I'm just saying because there's unappreciate underappreciated risks where we are as a country and there's also underappreciated risk where big countries that need to transition needs to happen and it needs to happen now so this is one of the biggest vul global vulnerability that no one's acknowledging that energy is the biggest sector that needs to transition. So I, I, I appreciate this, this event because I know Arena appreciates energy. So basically the message here is our vulnerability to climate change is inextricably linked to our vulnerability to the metal supply chains around the world. So as I said, we are fully aware of the clear and present danger posed by the existential threat of climate change and the drastic action is required to make that change. So when you ask Noru why we did this, our vision is that the recovery of these nodules from the ocean floor will provide that critical mix in the metal supply chain and in aiding our transition to clean renewable energy sources as well as creating the foundations for a circular economy. And the sustainable use of our oceans includes responsible recovery and extraction of critical method metals housed in polymetallic, polymetallic nodules. So for Nauru, we consider operationalizing the fundamentals of the common heritage of humankind principle and the development of the area and its resources as a timely contributor toward the achievement of not only our transition, but the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So our vision encompasses one of robust and fair regulation and, con and hopefully continued mechanisms that promote transparency, accountability, as well as ensuring the effective protection of the marine environment through appropriate environmental management measures. I hope that answers, I'm sorry, it's, I'm trying yeah. to be. Yes, it, it does. So. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. It does make sense what you are sharing and thank you for, for your very thorough uh, answer. Uh, now I would like to, uh, to move to, to John um, and the metals company and, and also ICA if you have something to, to add. So ramping up the supply of critical materials fast enough is one of the, the biggest challenge seen when we are talking about minerals and the energy transition. So can you tell us like what is the timeline of the deep sea mining project and how long does it all take to get into the production? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll dive in. Um, so we are currently in um, 
uh, an exploration um, phase. Um, we have a, a, an exclusive exploration contract with our partner, uh, via our partner, Laurie, um, as well as um, Tommel. And um, that exploration phase is coming to a, a culmination with a, an integrated pilot uh, system test um, uh, later this year, as I explained. And um, beyond that, we, um, we work with the regulator, the International Seabed Authority, who are uh, now uh, considering uh, the preparation of a uh, exploitation framework, beyond exploration and exploitation framework. And if that falls into place, and if our permitting applications are successful, we envisage we could have an early production as soon as late at the end of 2024. But a number of things have to fall into place. Uh, the culmination of the exploration phase, a successful permitting phase, and, and not least of which the ISA uh, preparing and issuing an exploitation framework to allow us to apply. So that's that's the, the way we see the, the timeline framework at the moment. Thank you. And Ulrich, do you have anything to, to add? Uh, just what has been, has been said before. So uh, the regulations are under negotiations just now. We're just in the middle of, of the sessions we have for this. Uh, we just finished the first two weeks and there, are, there will be another four weeks uh, with a lot of, of negotiations about the, the exploitation regulations and what it needs actually to apply for an exploitation license if when the regulations are in place. Uh, as I said, 168 members have to agree. One no means no, right? So they all have to agree to the process and to the regulations. And uh, yeah, this is going on uh, um, because of the trigger, which has been, been pulled. There's a little bit pressure on the pot, <laughs> right? So uh, we need to be done by, by, by next year, but we are, on our way, and it's a challenging, but 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 it also it 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 provides uh, progress, and that's good, I think. Thank you very much. I will now turn again to you, Your Excellency, and I just would like to ask, like, what are the national institution or research institution that uh, there are there to support this new field in our and how could this or how could they leverage a cooperation with mining companies to ensure the sustainability of uh, deep sea mining? Can you elaborate on that a little bit for us? Thank you. Sure, so every aspiration that every country has as a developing state is to ensure and um, harness uh, public-private partnerships, be, be it in um, sustainable development, be it in a, any other climate agreements and everywhere. So in terms of, as, as, you, as you rightfully questioned, what is the capacity building? So at this moment, we're working with um, Nori, our partner, to send an observer to, we will send an observer on the, on the vessel to watch the test mining and everything. So we haven't started any mining nor any, any activity at, as, as per regulation, it's just in exploration. So we're planning as a due, as a country itself to try to prepare for the next steps. And that is including of capacity building. And so that was also offered by the International Seabed Authority in terms of active, uh, in terms of capacity building with our partners and everything. So there's no mining happening. That's that let me be clear because this is under regulated issues. So in case everyone thinks that we're already mining, there's none. It's exploitation and exploration, and we're still doing our capacity in terms of what happens to the next step. So thank, so hope thank that's you. clear. Thank you. And uh, are you also thinking about how this will uh, impact communities? And are you working with communities also beyond the national institutions? So we have a country manager on the ground who explains all of this, but let me clarify, Nauru is a Pacific Island state, which means we have been dependent 
solely on marine resources for all our lives. So sustainable use is a very important element and coming from the ocean where most of it is 99% of our exclusive economic zone and our land rights. So, well, we don't have much land, we have more oceans than land. It's normal for us to use sustainably the resources from the ocean that's been blessed to us. So it's kind of incumbent on us to see the ocean as an extension of our culture and our heritage. So we don't see this as a, as a difference, but it's been explained across the, across the, the, the country of what Nori is as our partner and what we, ex what we hope to do in terms of the, um, the deep sea minerals and our aspirations. So Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, let's take one more question. Uh, I will turn to you, John, if you can elaborate a little bit more, you touch upon that, but it's about this biggest critique of deep sea mining and all these environmental impacts. So if you can share with us a little bit more uh, about all the engineering considerations that have been implemented to minimize or are being implemented or are being considered to, to mitigate the, the, the impact such as operation of tailings and, and plumes. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I uh, would say um, in the general sense, you know, the, the sort of global uh, energy community has become uh, quite expert at um, exploiting resources from the, the deep oceans over the years. I've personally worked in energy, oil and gas, renewable energy uh, for 30, 35 years. And a lot of our technology um, is designed just for that, for the most efficient and minimal impact um, on the environment. That's, that's, that's kind of what we, 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 we do as, as, as engineers. So I would say you've got a, a wealth of, of, of engineering and technology. I know there's been questions about artificial intelligence. We use a lot of very advanced sensors now, a lot of data processing algorithms um, in order to understand these very complex uh, ocean engineering uh, the, the, uh, technologies that would be developed. Um, so, you know, don't underestimate the advances in, in science and engineering. Um, that have gone on, and not just from oil and gas and marine renewables, but also from deep water telecommunications industry, from the marine defence uh, sector as, as well. Um, what's currently going on is, is definitely uh, ongoing, uh, really quite significant ongoing investment in technology development. There's a number of research projects around the world being funded into uh, deep sea mining exploitation technology. I could cite projects in the United States under the ARPA-E Department of Energy Program, where we're looking at uh, yet further techniques for reducing the impact, particularly the sediment plume impact, um, significant research contracts underway uh, on, on that. And then on the terrestrial processing side, which we haven't really talked about today, uh, a large investment in, in how to uh, make the terrestrial processing, if you like, uh, greener and more energy efficient with, um, with low to zero waste discharge, which is definitely our, our goal. So, um, yeah, big question, but, you know, don't underestimate what the, the marine energy and defence and telecom sector has been investing in 30, 40 years. And a lot of the focus in research spending is now switching to this emerging sector, which is definitely coming um, of, of, of deep sea mining. And um, yeah, the various uh, technologies we're bringing to, to bear on it are, are all in the end about reducing the ESG uh, footprint um, and the, the efficiency of the process and uh, making the ESG footprint Produced and acceptable. That's our that's our job as engineers. Uh, so uh, I, I hope that I know it's a broad brush, but that's the, the truth of where we are. We're, we're, we're developing the technologies. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone want to add something to it before we we close the the discussion, Ulrich or Your Excellency? Is there anything you want to to add? Let me let me add. Um, I was I was quickly going through the chat and 
there was a, a, a remark um, concerning moratorium, which is asked for, right? Uh, I mean, this is this is this is noticed by many many people, many countries, many people, many can many many governments are concerned. It's good to be concerned because it 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 leads to 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 solutions basically. And just to give a, a number, actually, uh, because um, one thing which is always requested is that, well, we don't know enough. That's why we need a moratorium. Yes, yeah, sure. But a moratorium wouldn't help, right? Just last year, there were 71 million US dollars spent for only for environmental surveys from the 31 contractors, 71 million US dollars only $51 million for doing exploration, right? So this shows the enormous efforts by the contractors. And the contractors are asked by ISA for doing all these surveys. Uh, so I wonder who, who else would spend in a year $70 million just for environmental studies to fill gaps, right? So the, the actions, uh, the activities by the contractors fill a lot of knowledge gaps, which are, which are existing. Yes, nobody, everybody knows, right? But this helps to fill the gaps to get a better understanding on a uh, uh, submarine environment. And that's very important. And moratorium wouldn't certainly help in getting these information. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Martina, maybe just the last few remarks. Um, let me say as a country on a borderline of um, realizing that we're at a climate and security is a really big threat or climate is an existential threat. We're in a climate crisis. Our lived experience is showing us where it's already here. We don't have much to move forward with and big countries need to transition as soon as possible. We're not on the, the trajectory by the science. They say, let's the science guide us, IPCC science, the pulse on 1.5 degrees Celsius and keeping within that temperature limit is not within our range or there's a narrow window for us. And that's why I like Irina's work because you help us move towards renewable, but we're not the ones who needs to move to renewable. Let's be clear. The big countries need to transition and there's no other way to transition. If we need to look at the oceans to look us, to take us that next step forward, then Noru is willing to take that step because we're an oceans people, but it's not about ocean action. It is climate action that will get us to the next steps and keep us viable as states and as countries. So I just wanted to make sure that we're not missing the point here. We're trying to find solutions because key countries are not making that sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very strong uh, ending to our uh, discussion. I'm afraid uh, we are going to have to wrap up uh, this lively discussion. We can really go on. So for that, let me invite back uh, Dol Gillen from Irina to share just a very few points which stood out for him from our discussion uh, today. Uh, Dolph, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much to uh, the presenters and the panelists. I think it was a very, uh, a very insightful uh, presentation. So what we heard is that there is different types of subsea resources. We didn't go into much detail on all of them. We mainly focused today on, on modules. So that is maybe something to explore a bit further in, in, in the future. We heard that this development has been going on for about 50 years now. And uh, it's, it's reaching a different stage. So now there is a discussion of uh, moving from uh, exploration to exploitation. And there is an, an, a lot of discussion ongoing uh, regarding the uh, environmental impacts. And uh, there is different um, let's say positions, political positions on, on uh, whether we should now go ahead or not. If everything goes uh, as 
uh, as uh, very fast, then you could see start of exploitation in three to four years. And you have to see that in, in the context of an energy transition where we need to ramp up critical materials significantly uh, by 2030. So it may play a role in that, but it's very likely it will be a small role in the overall growth of critical material supply. And uh, yeah, I, I think the conclusion also is that, uh, that uh, uh, th th there are many aspects to this that we have not explored today and, and uh, maybe more discussion is, is warranted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dol, for nicely wrapping this all up. And with that, let me thank again our speaker, uh, Her Excellency Ms. Margot Deye from Nauru, which, yeah, she joined us uh, from, from New York, uh, Uli Schwartz Champera from the International Cyber Authority joining us from Jamaica, and John Machin uh, from the Metals Company. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, for sharing with us your views, your perspective, your knowledge, and your experience. Also, thank you all for, partici for your participation uh, and for your interesting remarks and questions. We hope you enjoyed the presentation and discussion. We hope you learned something new and uh, that you agree that uh, we, should we, we should continue discussing it uh, further. And with that, uh, I would like to encourage you to stay tuned for our next webinars after the summer. We will be posting the presentation and the recording on our website. So please visit our website. And with that, I would like to wish you a great, great rest of the day. Goodbye and see you soon.